Have you ever had someone tell you, you're not cutting it? I expect more from you. You can do better than you've been doing. You're capable of better work. You aren't applying yourself. You're being lazy. You're not giving your best effort. It might have been a teacher, a coach, a boss, a parent, a sibling, a teammate, a friend. Well, I remember my high school teacher talking to me when I was a freshman about my performance in his algebra class. He said, Jeff, you're capable of better work. You're not applying yourself. You're being lazy. You're working far below your potential. Now, at the time, I was not very happy with my teacher for saying that to me, but I knew he was right. I was being lazy. I wasn't giving my best effort. I wasn't applying myself. I was doing just enough to get by. And unfortunately for me, I didn't take up the challenge of my teacher. I passed algebra as a freshman, and then I didn't take any more math classes in high school. I thought math classes were too much work. In fact, I didn't take any college prep level classes of any kind in high school. Too much work. I did the minimum required to graduate from high school, and that was it. Woodshop, home ec, arts and crafts, auto shop, journalism, PE. Those were the classes I took because they were fun and they were a lot less work. Well, after, gra after graduating from high school, I decided I wanted to go to college. So I enrolled as an art major at college. This is all true. I'm not making up any of this. Why did I enroll as an art major? I liked art, and I thought it would be easy. I was following the same track that I had followed in high school, taking the easy way. Well, then about a year and a half into college, I decided to change my major to civil engineering. But I was faced with a big problem. Engineering required a lot of math and science. And I was poorly prepared for that since I had pursued the easy track in high school. I had a lot of catching up to do. I had to take all of the math and science classes in college that I should have taken back in high school before I could even start taking the math and science required for the major. But I did it. I ended up taking trigonometry and advanced algebra, three semesters of calculus, differential equations, statistics, chemistry, three semesters of physics, a bunch of engineering classes, which all required lots of math. Surprisingly, I got through it. My math teacher in high school had been right about me. I hadn't been applying myself. I was being lazy. I really was capable of better work. I wasn't challenging myself. I wasn't giving my best effort. It was right for him to expect more from me. Well, this is what the author tells his readers in the section of the letter of Hebrews that we'll be looking at today. He says, you can do better than you've been doing. You're capable of better work. You're not applying yourself. You're functioning far below your potential. You're being lazy about your life in Christ. Today we're entering into the third great warning given in the letter of Hebrews. The first warning was back in Hebrews 2, 
verses 1 through 4, the main idea of that warning is expressed in verses 1 through 3 when he writes, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? The second warning was given in Hebrews 3, and it actually ranges from 3.7 all the way through 4.13. But the main idea is expressed in Hebrews 3.12 through 14, where he writes, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We've come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. And now today we're in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, where it says, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. If we go back up to verse 11... He says, we have much to say about this. Well, what's the this that he's talking about? The writer has a lot he wants to tell his readers in particular about the priesthood of Jesus Christ and about the likeness of Jesus and Melchizedek as priests, which we've already begun to talk about. But, he says, it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. So beginning... With this verse, the author, he digresses from the main subject that he's been talking about in the first portion of chapter 5 up through verse 10, and he won't return to it until he gets down to Hebrews 6.13. At this point in the letter, he feels the need to address what he believes to be a serious problem with many of those who he's writing to. He has much he wants to tell them about this amazing Savior of ours, Jesus Christ, but it's difficult because they're not putting the effort in to try to understand these things. The eternal nature of the Word of God is evident here because not only was this a problem with many of the believers at the time the letter of Hebrews was written, but it's also a problem with many believers in our own day. Even in this very church, on this very day, at this very moment, in fact, this is something that we all need to continually battle against in virtually every area of life, don't we? I mean, there's a relentless pull towards laziness that we need to push against if we're going to make progress. I mean, if we don't put effort into maintaining our relationships with others, those relationships begin to deteriorate. If we don't put effort into maintaining our physical health, our physical health will begin to deteriorate. If we don't continue to put effort into our jobs, we can expect that what we get out of our job will deteriorate, both in satisfaction and in financial reward. And if we don't put effort into maintaining and growing our spiritual health, our spiritual health will deteriorate. He says, you no longer try to understand. The Greek word translated into English means slow, sluggish, slothful, dull, lazy, lack of effort, not listening. The Greek philosopher Plato used to call some of his students nothroi, which is this word used here, meaning that they were slow to understand. They were lazy. These believers, they aren't putting any effort into trying to understand these things. They have been 
lazy and slothful about these things. This is a condition that these people have slid into. And I think it's, it's worth noting that, that they've slid into this. The author is not saying that these people have a learning disability or are intellectually challenged. There's nothing wrong with their ability to learn and understand. They have the potential. They have the capability. They don't lack the ability. They lack the effort and the determination. They're sluggish and lazy about the things of the Lord. They've failed to move past the most elementary teachings of their faith, he tells them, because they're not expending any effort to learn and grow in their knowledge of Christ. We have to apply ourselves and expend effort to get and to increase in understanding and knowledge of the Lord. Sitting back and expecting it to just magically be dumped into our head and our heart is not the way it works. Flip over to Proverbs chapter 2 for a moment. In verse 1, My son and my daughter, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Look at the words and the phrases in these verses. In this passage of Proverbs. They're, they're all action words and phrases. He says, accept my words. Store up my commands within you. Turn your ear to wisdom. Apply your heart to understanding. Call out for insight. Cry aloud for understanding. Look for it as for silver. Search for it as for a hidden treasure. And what's the reward for accepting, storing up, turning our ear, applying our heart, calling out, crying aloud, looking as for silver, searching as for treasure? Then you will understand. The fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And then I love the last verse of that passage where it says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. He rewards our efforts. Like it says in James 4 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. He responds. Oh, he loves it when we seek after him like this. Going back to Hebrews 5, verse 12. It says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. These people have been followers of Jesus long enough that they should be able to teach others by this time. But instead, they still need to be instructed in the ABCs of the faith. And, and that's the literal Greek sense of the translation of elementary truths, the ABCs. They're not ready to go on to learn about the deeper things of the Lord such as the priestly work of Jesus. They're stuck, never moving past the most basic doctrines and truths of Christianity, he tells them. He says, you need milk, not solid food. By this time, they should be eating adult food, but instead they're still drinking milk from a bottle. An adult can still enjoy a tall glass of milk. Amen? I mean, there's nothing wrong with milk. It does a body good. There's nothing wrong with the elementary teachings about Christ. It's good to be reminded again and again of these precious truths. We never move past those things in one sense. The thing that's wrong is when a person who 
ought to be able to eat a nice, thick, juicy steak. Instead, has never weaned their self off of only drinking milk from a bottle. They're like a full-grown man or woman who is still behaving like a baby, sleeping in a crib, drinking milk from a bottle, still not potty trained, wearing a diaper, crying and throwing a fit whenever things don't go their way. I mean, it's kind of gross to, to see that, picturing a, an adult person sitting in a crib, wearing a diaper, drinking out of bottles. Like, we all know that's just wrong. Every believer is to always be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to also become a disciple of every, of, a disciple of, of, of others, every one of us. We're not supposed to be stagnant ponds, but rather living streams, so to speak. A, a pond becomes stagnant when there's excessive accumulation and no circulation or flow going through and out of the pond. Just keeps going in and in and in, but it doesn't go anywhere. Stuff grows in a static, stagnant pond, but it's not the kind of stuff you want to grow. The same thing happens in a stagnant life. Stuff grows, but it's not the kind of stuff we want to grow. A living stream, on the other hand, it has a constant flow in and out, keeping everything fresh and replenished and full of life. We want to be like a living stream, taking in and giving out to stay healthy and growing. Now, obviously, not everyone is called and gifted to teach the church at large. Not everyone has the gift of teaching. But all of us are able to teach on some level, sharing our life experiences and faith in Christ with others, helping those younger in the Lord than ourselves to know Christ better and to trust Him more fully with our life. For those of you who are familiar with the 12-step program, this is similar to the idea of being a sponsor. For those of you who are familiar with the business world, this is similar to the idea of being a mentor coming alongside another person and helping them on their journey of faith in Christ. It's not something that's to be left to the professionals. It's the job of every Jesus follower to help other Jesus followers follow Jesus. Verse 13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So the author, he, he expands now on his meaning of his milk versus solid food analogy. Solid food and being mature, he says, has to do with training ourselves to distinguish good from evil. It has to do with Righteousness, he says, it has to do with having the mind of Christ, thinking like Christ, looking at life from a Christ-centered perspective and putting the, into practice the teachings of Christ. Now, before moving on here, I, I want to say a few words about what is not mature teaching and what is not maturity in Christ because there's some topsy-turvy stuff that gets floated through the church. I want to say maturity is not chasing the latest Christian fads blowing through the church. These are often called the mature things of Christ by those who are into them, but a study of the scripture will quickly show that these things are typically popular with the immature, not the mature. Beware of getting caught up with the fads and the hot new trends and the emotional buzzy stuff making its way through the church community. 
We need to use discernment and wisdom, which comes from genuine spiritual maturity, to see through the sparkle and the paint and the shiny stuff to what's truly good and of the Lord and genuinely soul-enriching. There's a whole lot of stuff that's the spiritual equivalent of junk food. It tastes good going down and it gives you a quick buzz, but it doesn't provide lasting nutritional value for our soul. Don't confuse people who are always talking up their spiritual game and are quick to share their insights and their knowledge as those who are spiritually mature in Christ either. Loud, flashy, know-it-alls, not mature. The mature are those who, he says here, those who by constant use have trained themselves. The Greek word here translated into English as trained is gemadzo. You probably recognize that. We get our English word gym and gymnasium from that Greek word. Spiritual maturity is not something that comes overnight through sudden breakthroughs. It comes from a long, steady, consistent, disciplined walk with the Lord, living by His Word, having learned to apply it in all of the different areas of our life, steadily growing in Christ's likeness and Christ's mindedness, learning to trust him through everything that comes to us in this life. See, instead of following after what is popular at the moment, the shiny things, find the battle worn saints who have spent years walking consistently with Jesus, living a life of faith in him, who have that beautiful, godly countenance that only comes through years of being with Jesus. Find some of those people and start hanging around with them, watching them, listening to them, learning from them, imitating them. Those people are not easy to find, though, because they're humble by nature, which means they don't draw a lot of attention to themselves, and they can easily be overlooked by those who are drawn to shiny things. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 4.7, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. That's kind of his way of talking about the shiny things and the buzzy things. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Paul writes in Romans 12 too, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's grow in Christ. No matter what our age in the Lord might be, let's seek to grow in Him. If you are a new Christian, God bless you. Drink up that nourishing milk of the Word of God. It's food for your very life. Dive in and keep adding to your knowledge and growing in your faith and seeking the Lord. To those of you who are growing in your knowledge of Christ and giving your life in service to the Lord in whatever ways He brings across your path, I want to encourage you to keep it up. You're doing great. The Lord is very pleased with you. Galatians 6, 9, Paul wrote, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You're doing great. Keep it up. But some of us, we need a kickstart. 
to get our life in Christ going again. Here's some things that, that can help us. The first one, you know, there was a time when we didn't really need to say this, but it needs to be said now in these post-pandemic days. Start attending church regularly in person. Make it a priority in your life again. Live streaming church is a great option when we can't be here in person or there's something that prevents you from being able to be here. But when we can be here in person, we should be. It's a better choice for our soul. Treating church attendance as just one of many possible activities for the weekend is not getting it either. It needs to be a priority that should be, that should be scheduled around. We all know this. We all know this, right? Get into a small group Bible study. That interaction with other believers can be a huge boost in encouragement. Get involved in serving others. Getting our eyes off of our own problems and issues and onto others and something bigger than ourselves is a very good thing. Start sharing your faith with others. It'll light a fire under you. Tap into resources that will challenge and strengthen your faith. Books, podcasts, teachings. There's lots and lots and lots of stuff. We can spend so much time doing things that add no value to our spiritual life. Music, TV, film, social media. Change it up. Change it up. Start doing things that add value to your spiritual life. And I end with Paul's prayer in Philippians 1.9 for all of us. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So that you may be able to discern what is best may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your good word. And Lord, we, we hear the challenge that's spoken to us today that we can do better. We've, we're being lazy. There's many of us, we, we know that's being spoken to our heart, Lord. And we ask that you would help us to get going, to kickstart us again, Lord. That we would make you our priority in our life. That we would fall in love with you afresh, Lord. We would put in that effort to know you better, to grow in you, Lord. Make that so. In Jesus' name, amen.